Um, so we're going to do a song that I think some of you, uh, I know some of you know. Um, you can stay seated. If you don't know it, I think just receive it as um, one sung over you. stand.
You never stop working, even when I don't see it, you're working, even when I don't feel it, you're working, you never stop, you never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working, even when I don't see it, you're working, even when I don't feel it, you're working, you never stop, you never stop working, you never stop. a brief time of prayer. Uh, we've had some prayer requests, so Michael's going to lead us. Where for students and faculty and staff, it's 
kind of landing on us and you're beginning to feel a little burdened or maybe a lot. And so what we thought we'd do is just take maybe maximum four or five minutes to pray for each other. I know it's kind of radical Christian community praying for each other, but you know, we do radical things. There are a couple of particular needs we have on our hearts today. One of them is uh, some of you, many of you know Sarah Robinson, her sister Michelle, even now I think is undergoing uh, brain surgery for cancer. It's very, very serious. Uh, Cindy has asked us for prayer for Chelsea, her daughter, who's also suffering from cancer. Stan Porter's under the weather, but I wonder if we could have courage in addition to these to name our own needs as well, and just to say it, this is what I need right now. So I wonder if you would, I know maybe you didn't sit beside your best friend today, that's okay. Um, just groups of two or three maybe, or if, or if you don't like the person beside you, go find somebody else, I don't know, you know. Um, just for about five minutes, we're just going to have a moment of honesty before each other and honesty before God, where we say, oh man, you're the one I need. Could we help each other? Could we just pray for each other? Let's just take five to do that.
All right, we'll just give you another 30 seconds to finish that petition. Would you just stand? Let's stand together. Stand and lift up your hands to heaven. Oh, Heavenly Father, it is good to be your children, to know that we are held in your care, that you have heard the cry of your children, your servants. All these things we ask in the name of your beloved Son. Thank you that you have gathered us to yourself and that all our tears and all our hopes are gathered up in your love. This we pray in his holy name. Amen. Well, I've just been asked while we're standing, I've been asked to specifically pray for Cindy and, and Sarah, uh, just in case you didn't catch them, okay? So, Lord Jesus, we lift up before you Cindy and Chelsea. You know how deep your love is for them. We lift up Michelle undergoing surgery and Sarah and the family. And we ask in your holy wisdom and power that you would cast out cancer that you would bring new life and that each of these servants who turn to you would rejoice and be glad and see your face. Restore them to us, we pray. Bring hope and healing in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Let's continue our prayer and song. <clears throat> you can sit if you want to. <laughs> stand for one more song.
please be seated. Today's scripture is from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and 9 to 13. Therefore, I urge you, my dear family, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. This is the word of the Lord. Great to be with you this afternoon and to join in this uh, we've had this year on the church and culture. Um, Dr. Mutter stole my text, so I had to <laughs> change gears and go another way. Uh, but what uh, is on my heart today to share is, is kind of one of the ideas that's left outstanding in our church and culture analysis, which which I'm calling living a culture, living a particular way, orienting our life toward the gospel in such a way that others notice, to embody practices that shape and uh, that shape our lives and our communities toward the gospel. I'm talking about living a culture as a way of being and doing the gospel in the world. Let's pray. God, we ask that your spirit would minister to us those ideas and, and thoughts that will glorify you, that will enable our communities to follow you. In Christ's name, amen. <coughs> so, I want to start with Paul's injunction in Colossians 4, 5, and 6. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone. It's a good start. Read from a church and culture perspective, Paul invites us to consider the activities for insiders and outsiders. We have a responsibility, Paul says, to both. But our manner of life and our grace-filled speech should be observable to outsiders whenever the opportunity presents itself. We should be ready to act, to live the gospel out and to respond with that readiness to outsiders. This concern for our public witness isn't just a Pauline idea. Peter articulates the same kind of admonition, 1 Peter 3.15. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. I love that. But do this with gentleness and respect, qualifiers. 
With an orientation to reverence for Christ, we're invited to offer a reasonable hope that is to outsiders with gentleness and respect. And a key element for Peter in this text is always be prepared for that opportunity, for that moment, to give a reason of the hope that you have. So this readiness to act, this orientation to welcome outsiders requires our imaginative consideration. I started to think about the ways that we um, make preparations. Um, first of all, if you, if you ever planned a dinner, um, you might uh, be thinking about dinner right about now, uh, <laughs> wishing for a dinner. But uh, you know, there's a lot of preparation that goes into hosting a dinner, you have a, a careful to-do list, you invite your guests, you, you need to know their dietary needs, you need to plan that meal carefully and shop for it and set the table and then that the work of timeline food prep, like so everything lands at the same time. It takes a lot of planning, being prepared. I used to be athletic. Uh, I had certain knee surgeries and other things. But I, I could see myself in these in the competition, like getting ready for a competition as a preparedness thing. Um, this particular sports coach says, you should envision yourself as winning the competition. That's a good start. And then be optimistic, stay focused on your abilities, avoid distractions, cut back on your training. You, you need some rest before get a good sleep, high carbs, prepare the night before and then meditate just before you compete. Be prepared. Or for our context, maybe preparing for a doctoral examination might be something you're thinking about. You gotta review what you've written and notice the key scholars who've tended to that subject and be clear about your contribution and rehearse your answers and support with evidence your claims and expect some resistance and maintain your poise, but always be precise and clear-minded. Perhaps one thing we've learned from the recent societal lockdown of COVID-19, that it's difficult to prepare for every eventuality. I mean, were we prepared for this? Do you remember standing six feet apart as you awaited entrance into grocery stores? Were we prepared for lockdown for our churches to be closed? Were we prepared for disruptions to our gatherings or severe restrictions on our whereabouts? Were we prepared to move all our meetings online and wear masks in socially approved situations? Clearly, we weren't prepared. And that leads me to reflect on the reality that you can't always know what's coming. You can't always predict events. You can't anticipate life-altering weather events. An accident, by definition, is not foreseen. None of us expected a global pandemic. There are so many things in life that can't be predicted or estimated or anticipated or foreseen. So I like the paradigm that Paul gives us in Romans 12, 12. It's a short verse, but it has this paradigmatic trilogy that to me speaks into our call to be prepared people. Be joyful in hope, be patient in affliction, be faithful in prayer. I kind of chose this verse because I can remember it. I, in, grade, <laughs> in grade five, I remember I was in the Christian memory program and I actually memorized the book of James, uh, recited the book of James in our scripture memory program in grade five but I'm down to Romans 12:12 12, 12 now. <laughs> Verse 
The assertion here is that the Christian way of life embedded in this paradigm is a countercultural orientation that is captured by the imitation of exemplars and sustained by an enclave of spiritually attuned companions on the way. It invites a particular readiness to act, an orientation and a disposition to respond a certain way and a guidance into an internal preparation for every life contingency that comes. The way to live the culture of a New Testament enclave today is to live with other Christians who are good at being joyful in hope, patient in affliction, I see I don't even remember it now, faithful in prayer. <laughs> Just to point out, these are all being statements. They talk about a core habitus that we enjoy together as a Christian community. These are all theological statements. They say something about who God is. And these are all countercultural responses to what I'm going to propose are three cultural shifts. The age of anxiety, the age of cultural erosion, and the age of overwhelm. So be joyful in hope in an age of anxiety. It might be contested that we live in such an age, an age of anxiety. I don't know. What do you think? I, I think maybe yes. What do we know about the features of human anxiety? Well, we know that heightened fears often become embedded in our psyche. What was external from the outside becomes internal and affects us as an interior weight. Anxiety functions as an internal, an internal force. Secondly, we must remember that we all live under the threat of an uncertain future. Remember, we're not always prepared for every eventuality. Our capacity to envision a better future is always being tested by the realities of life, life in a broken world. You could say that anxiety is heightened. <clears throat> Third, we can say that while we manage or control our anxiety to some extent, there's a wearing down of our confidence. And finally, we might say that anxiety is contagious. We can easily spread our heightened apprehensions in our circle, thus increasing the social anxiety of our lived situation. The push and pull of anxiety and hope represent the real situation in which we are called to be God's enclave in the world. To this growing sense of anxiety, Paul offers, be joyful in hope. My dad told me the story of when he was a preteen youth, probably 12 or 13 years old in Alberta. He was enthralled with the landscape, living with his parents and family in the northern parts of, of Alberta in an area called the Peace River District. The Peace River itself spans two provinces and stretches over 1,300 kilometers, has beautiful landscapes. And on this particular day, my dad, a young teen, was enthralled with the river and the landscape, and he worked himself along the banks through the wilderness. And he was picking berries and enjoying the day, and he was also moving further and further from the homestead that they had carved out. I imagine it to be a beautiful, mysterious, and a captivating day. At least that's how my dad told the story. As dusk set, he could imagine what happened. He couldn't find his way back home. He had lost his bearings. He was hopelessly lost. And as night fell, he knew he would be sleeping in the woods. He was afraid. He was anxious. He was worried. The next morning, he started out and found his way to the river and with some effort, finally stumbled on a small homestead. And he had moved tens of miles from home. But these folks were able to take him by horse and buggy 
to town and he was reunited with his family. I think of this first part of the paradigm, be joyful in hope as a compass. The true north of our orientation in the world of culture is the telos of the future that God is making and of which we now share a glimpse. The eschatological future dictates here and now our fundamental orientation as believing persons. And part of our authentic witness in the world is to be characterized by hopeful disposition and joy that relies on the hope of the future that God is making. We are called to a hopeful life that expresses the exuberant witness of the God of promise. Jürgen Moltmann talks about this hope this way. He says, anyone who has grasped what Easter means has found an enduring hope. That's true. Anyone who is filled with this enduring hope in the light of Easter cannot be indifferent to the short-term hopes of everyday life. On the contrary, our daily hope is kindled by our enduring hope. And our enduring hope acts like a purifying fire on the hopes of every day, burning away the germs of vanity and the canker of resignation. We have no shortage of examples of anxiety in our day. We've endured the pandemic. Many are struggling with adequate income, housing or food. Newcomers to our land and other marginalized groups experience emotional strains from excessive bureaucracy and complex policies. Every sphere of our life, it seems, is challenged. And to this, Paul instructs, be joyful in hope. The kind of hope that inspires resistance to oppression that aligns with the poor in spirit and that catalyzes change. What does this say about God? Well, Paul weaves that together at the end of Romans, verse 13. I love it. May the God of hope, big idea, fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Be joyful in hope. Be patient in, in, in affliction in the age of overwhelm. In his comprehensive assessment of secularism, Charles Taylor says, we are living now with a wide sense of malaise at the disenchanted world, a sense of it is flat, empty, a multiform searching for something within or beyond it which could compensate for the meaning loss and of transcendence. Robert Dykstra draws on Mary Pfeiffer's call for the age of overwhelm. This is a kind of primal panic that sets in from a daily bombardment of information overload and a sense of helplessness amidst the vast global threats of climate change and terrorism. Can life be daunting and complex and at times disappointing? The post COVID period is a remarkable time of opportunity for us to demonstrate endurance, to sit quietly in the realm of God's ability to work out the complexities, to assist us in our helplessness and for God to reveal a path forward despite every evidence to the contrary comes this admonition, be patient in affliction, bear up, hold up, be strong, wait on the Lord, do not faint. Paul's calling us to the endurance of affliction, 
This is an invitation to a new posture and perspective, one in which we are willing and able to carry the burdens of our own lives and the burdens of those communities we are called to serve. Christian witness in our culture involves bearing up under the situations of life with active hope and trust in the faithfulness of God. While our global situation is difficult and the attention to the woes of this world can be deflating, the invitation for us as a community of countercultural narrative is to be patient in affliction. Bear up. What does this say about God? Well, Paul says it in 2 Corinthians 4, 7. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show, to demonstrate, to witness that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. The power to endure affliction comes from the sustaining hand of God. Spiritual attunement in the age of cultural erosion. Be faithful in prayer, the last part of our paradigm. In her important book, Dark Age Ahead, Jane Jacobs, a Toronto writer, states that writing, printing, and the internet give us a false sense of security about the permanence of culture. <coughs> Excuse me. Many aspects of our known culture are eroding and disappearing in the collective forgetfulness, she says. In her estimation, it is hard to envision a future where the core elements that bind our common vision for society will stay intact. She names five pillars of our core cultural capital that are being eroded. Community and family are rigged to fail. Higher education is shifting from education to credentialing. The practice of science and science-based technology is abandoned. Taxes and governmental powers are being dumbed down and self-policing by the learned professions is subverted. It's an interesting cultural analysis. She died before we could find out the results, but the jury's out. To this bleak situation of cultural erosion, Paul writes in the finale of his paradigm, be faithful in prayer. At the core of our life in this world is the God-given capacity to be prayerful, to abide with God. We are invited in this way to bring every matter and every concern of the erosion of our society to God. There was an unprecedented con concentration in the New Testament on the ongoing relationship with God through prayer in early Christianity. The early Christian community persisted in the life of prayer taught by Jesus and placed all cares and thanksgivings before God. So that brings us to the final movement of our paradigm, the movement towards communion with God the paradigmatic life of alignment is the move of deep and abiding prayerfulness. Prayer is not simply one task among many in our work as ministering persons. Prayer is our true vocation. And as Henry Nouwen says, the access of our existence. Be faithful in prayer. This is a reorienting practice of those who are ever awake to God's nearness, to God's abiding presence in our lives, to the situations of our society, and to the complexities of our world. Be faithful in prayer. <coughs> Henry Nouwen says, if there's any focus that the Christian leader of the future will need, it is the discipline of dwelling in the presence of God. It is the discipline of contemplative prayer. The central question is, are the leaders of the future truly 
men and women of God, people with an ardent desire to dwell in God's presence, to listen to God's voice, to look at God's beauty, to touch God's incarnate word, and to taste fully God's infinite goodness. It's hard not to invoke this last phrase, be faithful in prayer, as a countercultural orientation for us to be in deep communion with God. Few things are as countercultural. You don't have to be on Instagram very long to realize how many distractions and cultural pulls are out there to divert our attention, to entertain us, and to offer endless possible pursuits in life. People want to be beautiful and healthy and rich and successful and happy. We're distracted by many things. But our paradigm suggests rather single-minded orientation to God. What does it say about God? 1 Corinthians 1.9 God is faithful, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So what kind of community are we called to be? Shaped by exuberant waiting and hope, and by persevering trust despite affliction that must be endured, and shaped by prayerful attention to the experience of the abiding of God's nearness. The invitation is for us to be such a culture. Amen. Please stand as we sing one more song together.
Jesus come.